Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Bo O. It is 9.42 a.m. and time for me to get into the Word just a little bit and uh, I hope that you can join me. So my name is Bo Willett. I'm a uh, pastor at Calvary Christian Fellowship, uh, born in 1972, super influenced by my SoCal culture, grew up in the Ventura County in San Fernando Valley areas, born in San Fernando Valley, uh, North Hollywood kid. And um, anyway, so I certainly am a product of my culture and a lot of my going through the Bible. I certainly reference some of that as well. But, uh, you know, the big thing about, I think, sometimes just doing a devotion is just going through the Bible. And I know that's difficult for so many people. Um, So many people kind of like to go through little chunks or little sections of the scripture. And uh, that's kind of how they do it. But that's not how um, I actually came to understand uh, God, um, a a biblical worldview. It was actually through reading the Bible from Genesis on and uh, just being absolutely curious with what it said. Um, uh, I'm a product of a very secular progressive culture and and so I was uh, all that and uh, really what how my worldview changed was uh, a lot of times just simply reading through the Bible and and the Bible answers so many questions and people just don't realize that because they just don't go through it they just all they do is pick up these little sections bing bing ding bing bing and they don't realize how it's all intertwined it's one big story and uh it's one giant love story if that <clears throat> if you want to really boil it down but um you know a lot of people just haven't read the whole thing so i have a picture of my motorcycle up right there i had a super fun little ride this morning And uh, it's great to be back. That's why I'm a little late, by the way. But um, anyway, so Psalm 19, that's where we're at right now in our Through the Bible journey and devotional style, right? Just picking it up, kind of going through some of the applications that it goes through. So Psalm 19 is another um, uh, psalm or song written by David, King David. It's attributed to him. And it's for the choir director. Hey, you got a choir? Have you ever been in choir? I certainly was in university. Uh, So in Southern California, when I went to university, I had to take a year or two years, I forget, of university choir. But um, that certainly was a cool class. I was second tenor, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so to all my Matador friends out there, hello. Hope you're doing well. So it says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Psalm 19, very famous psalm, by the way. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Sometimes growing up, I'd be like, you know, God, I wonder if there's a God. But sometimes I was in amazement just by the creation itself. So I would be surfing. You know, I'd be at Sea Street or Rivermouth or, you know, Leo Carrillo. Uh, staircase, different places surfing. And, um, and it would hit me like, uh, man, it's beautiful. I just be like sometimes amazed at, at all the beauty. And sometimes when you're surfing, you catch things just at the right time and you see something that's ac- absolutely tremendous, just absolutely beautiful. And, um, and that certainly happened to me a lot. And, um, and sometimes, I, I, even as, as an atheist guy, as a more secular guy, I would think like about a deity. I didn't know who, of course, but I would just think of God. Like, whoa, like, I wonder how this got made. And I wonder, like, you know, God, you know, just how it got formed and, and the years and the, the crashing of the waves and this and that and the sky and... You know, it, it, the horizons that you see when you're surfing and the power of the surf. And and I love how David, who's a, a shepherd guy, he's a guy who's worked out in the fields. He's a farmer. I'm not a, so much a farmer, but he's a guy who's been out there on the farm, so to speak. And he's used to seeing beautiful sunsets and sunrises and looking in the plains and, you know, seeing just the beauty of the creation. And he says, hey, the heavens, he looks up and he sees the sky the heavens, right? The planets, the heavens, the stars, the heavens, they proclaim, they say something. 
they shine, if you will, the amazing value, the amazing grace, the amazing beauty, you could say, of the deity of God. It's a very, in a sense, general statement. I think many human beings have made this statement uh, just in passing, and they don't really know maybe the God that they're talking about, but they certainly have, in a sense, invoked the deity by being overwhelmed by just how small we are in the creation. You know, I think sometimes when I'm riding the bike nowadays, you know, I get that same kind of vibe of just amazement, you know, just blown away by God. Hopefully you are too today. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth. Everybody knows it. And their, wor- and their words to all the world. And like I say, as an atheist too, as a secular guy, no one had to tell me in a sense about God because it seemed like everywhere around me, I was always amazed by the creation and I always wondered about God. That always hit my mind. And I find it odd that as human beings get to a place where we start wondering about God. You know, even without anybody in our face telling us about God, there's something in our minds, the way we react to the creation around us, the nature, if you will, that makes us think about these things and think specifically about the idea of a creator. So David says, hey, even, you know, those that don't know God, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Their word has gone out to the all the earth. That's cool to know. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run a race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. Mm, now it's going to get into some cool things about the Lord specifically. But it talks about the revelation of God, of course, from everything outside of us, right? Time, matter, and space. It's not the full picture of God, but it certainly reveals a part of the glory of God, (coughs) the creation. And that's cool to think about. It's cool to think about, too, because sometimes we don't trust God's ability to show himself or the, his character to people we love. And so we kind of try to control, you know, they don't know God. We try to control it. We try to force it. We try to, you know, get it going. Where sometimes we just have to realize that Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Hey, God has made himself known. It's everywhere around. The words of God go forth every day. Isn't that amazing? So our loved ones, we know, are getting a revelation of God. Are they listening to it? That's another question. Might not be at the moment. But we know God's revelation has gone out. And that's something we can hold fast and trust right today. And so it says now the instructions of the Lord are perfect, uh, reviving the soul. Hmm, Reviving. Hey, are you revived? Well, maybe you got to, you know, look at the commandments of God. Look at the instructions of the Lord. It says they're perfect, right? Reviving the soul. I love the older versions that say the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, right? Doing something to the soul, moving us into conversion, moving into reviving us, you know. Uh, The law points us to the need of a Savior. It moves us in our soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Mm, I can trust the Lord. I can trust what he's saying. What he's saying is good. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. Hey, do I want joy to the heart? Look to God's instruction, right? The instruction, the commandments of the Lord are right. That's cool. You know, the Bible's given me an objective right, right? Not a right based on what I think is right. Because there's, I don't know, 7 billion, 8 billion people on the planet. That's a lot of individual right and wrongs, right? 
who can judge another person, right? I always said that, right? You do you, I do me, right? We all got those cultural things in us, right? Where the Bible's saying, no, there's an objective right that's outside a bow. Hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not about what I think is right, but it's what, about what is actually right. Hmm. Interesting. It's almost like there's a moral law, like there is a natural law. Can you fight the natural law? Good luck. <laughs> Good luck doing it, right? You don't like gravity? Mm, too bad, right? You don't like the way things are out there in nature? Mm, you know what? You, you can't change it. And it's like, it's it's just the law, right? And But, you know, we try to change it. We try to alter. We try to do different things. We certainly try to say good is bad and bad is good. And we hope that works, but it never does. Oh, you know, so it says reverence or it says the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Hmm, that's cool. It's a good. I like that. It's a good title. Insight for living. Right. And the commandments of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are clear, clear, not vague. You know, do I think God's words vague? Maybe I need to look into it a little more. Hmm. What part of thou shalt not steal do I not understand? Right. Maybe it's very clear. And maybe I'm the one who's a little muddled. You know, it says uh, the laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Hmm. Sometimes we kind of bag on God because we go, he's not fair. God's not fair. Oh, yeah? Well, look at you. Are you fair? You know, how's your being just going? You know, or do you find some inequity with you? Some, you know, iniquity with you, right? Um, But yet it says, what? That the laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Hmm. It's a righteous judgment. God is a righteous judge. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. What am I going after today? Is it financial gain? Is money really the driving force of my world? You know, do I want, am I, do I, is my life kind of like, hey, I need to get this amount of money so I can do this and 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 and then I can live the way I want to live? Or am I more concerned about following the call of God and letting the chips fall where they may as far as all that stuff of where I might live and where this and the potential of that and can I do this sometimes money becomes the primary and the call of God becomes the secondary instead of we flip that hey getting out the gospel sharing serving the body of Christ becomes the primary in my retirement becomes the secondary it's kind of hard to think that way sometimes we're so wrapped up in kind of the way that we've been trained over the years and our culture and what our culture says is how we should do it at what age we should do it and that's very common in us we get very much hooked into a cultural conditioning you know but uh, here the bible says that You know, the laws are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold, even all the cash in the world, right? God's laws and commandments are to be sought out and to be honored and cherished. You have that, man, you got something that's far better than any gold. Man, that's really something cool to grasp in our minds. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. So honey is sweet. It's better than your ice cream. It's better than the cookie that you ate. It's better than all the the stuff that tastes so good to you. And this is so cool, right? Do I see God as tasting better? Do I see God as tasting better than that thing? Sometimes, man, I don't, and I go towards that thing. But this psalm is God, David's saying, hey, God, your laws are better. They taste better. 
then that thing, then your anger, then your frustration, then your goals, then all that. The law is better than all of that. Then your lust, then your greed, you go down the list. God's word tastes better. Mm. Sometimes this is hard to see. You know, you're younger. You think you got your health all intact. You think things will stay the same in your marriage, maybe. And you kind of tend to go, you know what? You get so focused in on that, you tend to think that's the greater, that's the better. And then as you get older, you realize, nope, things start, you know, chipping away at you. Sure enough, the knees start giving. The elbows don't feel good. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. Pretty soon you start realizing, oh, man, the foundation that I thought was so sure, so secure, is not always going to be that way. Boy, you know. My heart and flesh will fail. My wife's heart and flesh will fail. But God is the strength of my portion forever. Oh my gosh, maybe I need to put more value in the infinite than in the finite. So maybe that's happening to you. It says uh, they are sweeter. They taste good, right? And then verse, what is it, 11? They are uh, a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey him. Hmm. There's a reward for those who obey the word. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Oh, man, good question. Hey, God, how can I know all the stuff that's going down in me? It says, cleanse me from these hidden faults. Oh, so many hidden faults, so many things I don't know, so many doors that haven't been opened. Yet, Lord, I become willing for that door to open and healing to happen. You know, willingness, they say, is cracking that door open. It's now I am willing opening the door to that room that mm, no I don't want anybody to go into but if you become willing right and willingness a willing heart will open up that door and now maybe we can go in there and start doing some cleaning and that takes a lot of courage and a lot of honesty in a life cleanse me from these hidden faults boy do we have them keep your servant from deliberate sins for those volitional sins those just deliberate going against the word keep me from those god don't let them control me because they want to sin wants to control and dominate don't you see that in the world don't you see that even as an atheist that you you know things want to dominate you all the time your emotions your mind whatever you want to call it your biology your everything's controlling everything seems like it's just you're a robot just going on the system the button gets pressed and you go right no stop it And he says, don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. The desire to be free from what guilt? To be free from what sin? Man, how can you be free from guilt? How can you be free from sin? I know we'll ignore. We'll push it down. We'll just push it down enough. And if you push it down enough, then guess what? Maybe it'll go away. But then it rears its ugly head again, right? And you can't seem to get around it. You're a jerk, right? You, you, you want to push it down. You want to cover it with something. But mm, it just, it comes out again and again and again and again. And you've hurt people again and again and again. And your words have hurt again and again. And you're cunning and you tear down. And you don't seem to build, but you seem to push down. And it's because there's pride there. You don't want people to see your flaws. And there's all these issues. And boy, we're all just a big ball of yarn just tangled and, you know, all that yuck, right? Oh, gosh. (laughs) Help me from all this sin, the stuff I don't know that I do, the stuff I do know that I do, and that I may be free of guilt and sin. And boy, Jesus has come to free us of guilt and sin. He has come to pay the price for our guilt and our shame and our sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Mm, Isn't that true? The words of my mouth, the words of my mouth, the things I say, And the meditation of my heart, the things I'm thinking about, right, where my mind is at, be pleasing to you. So whatever's in my heart, my mind, whatever's coming out of me, 
Lord, may it be pleasing. My whole life be a burnt offering, right? That burnt offering. Remember, we studied that at one point, but it was that total, complete burning of the sacrifice, a consecrated offering to the Lord. I'm giving you everything. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So my rock and my redeemer. He's solid and he's the one who David knows who's redeeming him, buying him out of slavery, taking him from that pawn shop that was pawned. You know, you pawn an item, you redeem it, you buy it back, you take it out of slavery. It's bondage, right? And this is what Jesus has come to do, right? I've not come to be served, but I've come to serve and give my life as a what? Ransom for many. So, you know, when we think of the offerings of God that we went over in the book of Leviticus, they all pointed to different things. And David encapsulate, uh, in, is it encapsulates? Yeah, something like that. He, he, pit, he, he really does a good job of expressing the heart behind the sacrifices, you know, that might help you, you know, and uh, sometimes you just see these sacrifices in the book of Leviticus and you think it's kind of just mundane, boom, 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 boom. But, you know, David really shows the heart. Lord, I want to bring you everything. I want everything in my life to be something that's about you. It's a very cool thing, man. You know, consecrating your life. It's no longer secular, but it's a sacred life. You know, a set apart life for God. So very cool and a absolute gem of a psalm. So, you know, we've gone through some good gems. 16 was amazing, right? Uh, and then we see 19 is just an amazing psalm as well. One that we definitely want to hold on to, think about throughout the day. So you guys enjoy the day, 10 o'clock. It's ready to get going. And uh, you guys take care, okay? And talk to you later. Bye-bye.